Good evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Marsden Atlas. I'm the director of the Arthur Ross Gallery, and we're delighted to have you here this evening for a very wonderful talk, The Natural Wonders of the Jura. And I think I'd like to introduce our two speakers here. Petra Ten Dushata Chu, a specialist in the history of 19th century European art, has published extensively in this area. She is the author of the widely used college textbook, 19th century European art that I actually used in undergraduate school. And one of the two founding editors of 19th century art worldwide, an electronic journal devoted to the art of, of the 19th century. Chair of the Art History and Museum Studies Department at Seton Hall University for 21 years, she co-founded with Professor Emeritus Barbara Kate the Masters of Arts program in museum professions. And Reto, Reto Gire, investigates earth materials, their response to geological forces, and their interaction with the environment and humans. He is engaged in research projects around the world and is dedicated to promoting the health of our fragile planet through teaching, mentoring, and research. He obtained his PhD at ETH Zurich, in Switzerland, of course, was a professor at Purdue University, École Normale Supérieure in Paris, and the universities of Basel and Fribourg in Germany and Siena and Italy, and a visiting researcher at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization ah, and at Argonne National Laboratories. He is editor of Journal of Petrol. Law, I beg your pardon, Petrology, Chief Editor of European Journal of Mineralogy, a Fellow of the Mineralogy Society of America and the Geological Society London, an Honorary Member of the Mineralogical Society of Slovakia, and received an Honorary Doctorate from the Universe, Université de Haute Alsace in France. So thank you both very much for being with us this evening. And I think we'll have a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn, for your introduction, as well as for inviting us here today. I'm not sure about Reto, but I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and I expect to learn a lot tonight, which is not usually the case <laughs> when you give a presentation. Um, all right, so um, let's kind of go to the um, to um, the uh, conversation, which is actually going to be more me grilling Reto, uh, but <laughs> about all things that I would like to know. Uh, but uh, I will set it up a little bit, just give a little bit the art historical background, and then we kind of dive into the literally dive into the geology. Uh, the point of departure of our conversation is this very small painting you see behind me, signed in the lower left by the well-known French mid-19th century painter Gustave Courbet. And of course, the original uh, is hanging right there on the wall. Now, as many of you know, uh, the painting was rediscovered 13 years ago in an off-site storage area of the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine, and turned out to have belonged to Thomas B. Evans, a dentist who owed his reputation uh, to having taken care of the teeth of French Emperor Napoleon III and his wife Eugenie. So to do that, uh, Evans spent much time in Paris and used his time effectively, other than taking care of teeth, by assembling a large collection of contemporary paintings, which he bequeathed to the UPenn School of Dental Medicine. The school, however, sold the Evans bequest in 1983, but for some reason that I don't know, maybe Lynn knows, uh, this painting was not part of the sale and somehow ended up in a box, which somehow ended up in a basement. Once the work was discovered, uh, Lynn Marsden Atlas, who you just met, recognized uh, the merit of the work. She had it cleaned, she had it scientifically examined and evaluated by Quebec experts, and then organized this very fascinating exhibition uh, that surrounds us here. 
Now the painting represents a well-known natural site in Courbet's native region of the Franche-Comté. It is the so-called source du Lison, or the source of the Lison River, which is located near a small village called nantes sous saint anne Next slide, please. Uh, the work is undated, but it is one of several variants of a larger painting, which is also in the exhibitions hanging right on the other wall, on the other side. Um, and that painting is dated 1864 and is, <coughs> and is today in the collection of the Minnesota Marine Art Museum in Renona, Minnesota. Sorry. <coughs> And about that painting, we actually know quite a bit because we have an eyewitness account of its making by poor best friends, the Franche Comte sculptor Max Claudet. In the fall of 1864, Courbet was visiting Nonsou Saint Anne, and Claudet, who lived nearby in Saint went to visit him there. He reached the inn where Courbet was staying just when Courbet had finished his dejeuner his lunch. Courbet told him that in the afternoon, he had to paint a picture of the Source de Lison. Claude walked to two kilometers to the site with him, and then Courbet set up his easel. However, the wind blew it over and the canvas fell on a branch with poked a hole in it. Courbet was unperturbed. He pasted a piece of paper on the back to close the hole and started painting. Claudet expressed his surprise that Courbet's canvas was covered with a very dark, almost black prime. Courbet told him, quote, you are surprised that my canvas is dark. Nature without the sun is black and dark. I act like the light. I illuminate the points that catch it and the painting is done. <laughs> Sounds very easy. Claudet goes, to tell us, uh, goes on to tell us that Courbet, with his palette knife, you all know what the palette knife is, a kind of a spackle knife with a very long, thin blade. Uh, so with his palette knife, he dabbed small quantities of oil paint from, small glass, from a few small glass jars he had brought with him. Only four colors, according to Claudet, white, yellow, red, and blue. He mixed them on the palette and then started laying in the painting with his palette knife rather than a brush. He used the palette knife not only for the rocks, but also for the water gushing out from the cave. Explaining, or rather maybe justifying his use of the palette knife to Claudet, Courbet said, quote, try to use a brush to paint rocks like that, rocks that have been eroded by water and rain which have created long seams from top to bottom, end quote. So the original on the spot version of the Source, de la, uh, Source du Lison was painted in 1864, a year that marked the high point in Courbet's landscape production. Four years earlier, he had bought some land in his native, native village of Parmont, to construct a state-of-the-art studio for himself. Beginning in the fall of 1863, he settled down there to start a campaign of painting landscapes of the Franche-Comté region, which was to last for 20 months. All of Courbet's most famous landscapes date from this period. Later ones in large part are repetitions, variations, or as Andre Dombrowski, call, Dombrowski calls them, reimaginations, which is a good term because you see, of course, that these two paintings are, are actually quite different. So, the, so um, can I have the next slide? Oops, sorry. Now, before I start my questions to Reto, a few words about the Franche-Comté, a historical region of France that was once part of the county of Bourgogne, but later separated from it, hence the name Franche-Comté, or Free County. The region is located in southeastern France and borders in the east on Switzerland. Under Napoleon, it was divided into three departments, the Doubs, the Jura, and the Haute-Saône. And the Doubs, of course, is where Courbet is from. It's named after the Doubs River, which is one of the important rivers in Franche-Comté. Courbet came from Arnaud's, a small village in the Dupes department, 
but his father and grandfather were small landowners. Um, and I should say, just to kind of come back for a moment to the, uh, to the Sur de Liso, Barnons is about a 25 minute drive by car from the source de la the source de Liso in Anseau Saint Anne. And Anseau Saint Anne is in turn is very close to Salin, another town that we'll mention later in this paper. Like most inhabitants of the Franche Comté, Courbet was extremely proud of his native region, admiring the beauty of its landscape and celebrating its local culture, its language its food, its folk music. Like many of his rural middle-class contemporaries, he was a member of the Departmental Emulation Society, as they were called at that time, the Société d'Emulation du Dupes, an association that studied all aspects of the region, its geological origins, its human history, its flora, its fauna, and its agriculture and industrial exploitation. Hence, in emulation society, it was a kind of a better society to, to better the region. Uh, give me the next one. Uh, we return to our point of departure, uh, the Source du Lison uh, in, uh, that is hanging there, and that is now part of the collection of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I want to compare it here for a moment with a photograph which Reto just took when he visited it a month ago, I guess. Yeah. And it's, of course, amazing to see the realism of this, um, of this picture, right? I mean, it looks like he, he, maybe he went back there and painted it from the motif. Maybe he painted it of a photograph. Uh, the, 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 you know, this, this was a tourist site, was very much photographed. Uh, we do not know when he painted it, definitely later than 1864, but we, we know actually relatively little about the circumstances under which it was um, done. Now, um, normally um, we translate source to Lison as the source of the Lison River, but uh, this is not actually the source of the river. The, the Lison River uh, begins at, at, at a very different point. It's, this is somewhere in the middle of the Lison River. And so this is really my first question uh, to Reto. What is it that we're really looking at? Could you please explain that to us? Yes, yeah, so thank you. Uh, and yeah, it's mind boggling to see how realistic the painting was. It's just, you can go there today and you see exactly what he painted and it's still the same. So it's an amazing experience. So yeah, this is called the Source du Lison, and clearly we are not, you know, it, it's like a spring, but this does not look like your normal spring. Usually it's a trickle, a spring, but this is actually a river coming out of the mountain. And you see it's coming out at the bottom of a huge cliff. The cliff is about, it's more than 100 meters tall, and you have this rather big river coming out. So how can we explain that? This is actually an underground river. So it's flowing for a couple of kilometers before reaching this point on the ground. And that's a very typical characteristic of the Jura Mountains. And not only there, but it's actually a characteristic feature of a type of landscape that is known as karst. And maybe some of you have heard of that, karst landscape. This is uh, particularly well known from uh, Slovenia and Croatia, where the, the name is derived from. This is a landscape where the rocks are dissolved. And uh, they dissolve because they are limestones and they can be easily dissolved in rain. And natural rain is slightly acidic. So the more rain, rain you have, the more it dissolves. And so a characteristic feature of these landscapes is that they are actually full of holes. There are practically no above ground rivers. The rivers disappear. The valleys on the top of the mountains are typically dry. There are sinkholes, there are caves. And the rivers, sometime they appear again much, much further down the river. And what you see here on the top right is the um, Lison Dieu. That's officially the name, but the river is practically never there. Only in heavy rainfall you have the river. Otherwise, everything is going on the ground and it's making its way through these limestones. And you see these caves, it goes through various caves, an intricate path, and then comes out in a spectacular feature, the Creux du Billard. 
that uh, originally it was a cave, but it, in fact, it collapsed. So it's a true sinkhole. And you see it's about 100 meters high, it's very steep cliffs, vertical cliffs, and in very high, heavy rain or after the snow melting, the river is actually coming, the surface river is coming over the, the edge here, but also here there's a big hole and the river is coming down. Then it disappears again, only to appear down here at the actual Source de Lison. So that's a, a classic example of what we call an emerging river, very typical for or many karst landscapes around the world. These rivers can be extremely long. The longest is in Vietnam. It's a Song River, uh, and it's 19 kilometers long underground. You can take a boat on it. It's really spectacular. So this is how the river comes out, very unexpectedly. But there it is with lots of water for most of the year. But sometimes it trickles down to a very small little creek because there's not enough water. Great. Now, I wanted to ask one more thing about this. Um, uh, art historians have often wondered about what in Courbet's painting, maybe not so much in reality, but in Courbet's painting, it looks rather like a phallic sh shape kind of coming out there, out of the top of the rock. Could you also kind of tell us a little bit more about that uh, part of the uh, of the of the which is really characteristic of the source to Vison. Yeah, it's, it is a distinctive feature, um, and you rarely see something like that. And there are people who suppose that this is actually a stalactite, which is um, a formation that, form, that is built up in caves when water trickles down into the cave. And it is not a stalactite. And you realize that when you go there, because when you go there, you actually see the layers here of the original rock, rocks, the same layers that you see on the other side. So this is actually a leftover that was not dissolved away. So it's a pillar, but if we go back there in a couple of thousand years, it will be gone and probably the cliff will collapse. So it is not a stalactite. It's also not a stalagmite, which is the opposite of a stalactite. This is the features that grow from the hay floor up and very often they actually meet. But this is clearly a leftover, so a pillar that keeps the whole cliff together. This is also a photograph you just took, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, all of you have to go to the Franche Comte if you ever have a chance. It's, <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful yeah. region, although it rains a lot, but that's part of its beauty, I think. It is. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to show, we just wanted to show a couple of more slides because uh, the Franche Comte is full of these karst springs, right? Yes. And um, uh, Courbet painted several of them. Uh, here is the Source de la Loue, so it's the, the, the source of the River Loue, another river in the area, uh, which could have painted actually much more than the Source de Lison. There's some 10 versions of this painting in various uh, locations. And these, um, uh, these uh, sources, because the water came out with a huge amount of uh, force, uh, were often used for. Uh, Hydropower, right? Right, that's correct. I think this you and said still, this is still, it's the still used. This is a picture from last month at the Source de la Loue, and you see it, actually in Courbet's painting, you see these canals here. This is where they actually collect the water and they bring it to a power station. And today you have actually a power station right there, a few you know hundred meters down from the source, and people are very proud of it because it's renewable energy. It's Electricité de, de France that runs it. And so there's a dichotomy here between the people who don't want to see the industry and others who are totally in favor because it's a renewable energy source and a very good one. But it's a little bit more, it's not like it used to be at some point in the 19th century when it was right there, you know, they, they, right? Mm -hmm. They have removed it a little, so it's not, yes. it's not so visible. It's the battle between tourism and, uh, and you know, the environment, I guess. Um, then we have another one. This is another one that Courbet painted. Uh, actually, this was not done in 1864. It's a, a landscape that he did later, 1872. It's called the, uh, the Source Bleu. Actually, in Courbet's painting, it doesn't look that blue, but if you see the original, it is indeed has this very blue water, which I do not know the reason of the blue water, but must be some chemical or something like that. Yeah, there's some dissolved um, minerals in there, but also sometimes these springs have a lot of um, particles that float in the water and they reflect the sunlight or they reflect the blue color of the sky. 
they're very clean these rivers so they're not contaminated um Now, uh, we, I talked earlier about um, the Franche-Comté being back part of the, of the Jura. And um, the, the Jura mountains, uh, you know, are, I guess, partly in France and partly in Switzerland. And I wanted to ask Retter to tell us a little bit more about the Jura and also about the Jura and is the relation to the Alps because he is actually, and just told me, an Alpine specialist on the Alps. So, uh, but, and they are kind of different, I think, right? Yes, they are. Well, so you see here a bit of an unusual map that most people don't ever see. This is called a tectonic map. So it shows the different structural units of the earth at the surface. And you see here in these blue colors, this is actually the Jura, the dark blue colors and this light green. This is the actual Jura. There's Brézançon, Source du Lison is right here. Source de la Lou is over there. So this is the actual Jura mountains, mountain range. And they are very characteristic. They are part of the Alp, even, Alps, even though it doesn't look like that because they're separated from the real Alps, which are shown here in these many colors by what is known as the plateau here in Switzerland that goes all the way down to Geneva. But to the Southwest of Geneva, the Jura is actually connected with the the Alps. And so they are also connected historically. The Alps are actually much older than the Jura. The formation of the Alps it started about 90 million years ago when all these different packages of rocks were piled on top of each other. Some of these are coming from Africa, in fact, the top layers. Many of those are from Africa. And then very late in the game, we had the, the main phase of the formation of the Alps was about 35 million years ago. And the Jura only started to be folded at about 5 million years ago, a very late alpine formation. And it was formed as a reaction to the piling up of huge amounts of rocks here from different parts of the world. That's very characteristic, but a late bloomer. Mm. Now, um, I, was having dinner, I was having dinner with friends the other day and I was telling them about our upcoming conversation. And which started to talk about Jura and Jurassic. And so they asked, does the word Jura come from the word Jurassic? Or does the word Jurassic come from the word Jura? And what actually do we mean by Jurassic? Because it's not just stuff in the Jura, right? No. So uh, Jurassic is a, a time period in Earth's history. And let me put this a little bit in context because the Earth is pretty old, it's four and a half billion years old. And I'm showing you in the next slide, the, the four big eons of Earth's history. And you see they have different names, but uh, importantly, what you see here, uh, Proterozoic and then Phanerozoic. So this is somehow related to life. And indeed life is what allows us to distinguish different periods and different eons and different eras in Earth's history. And so at the very beginning, four and a half billion years, there was not much life. Uh, just about four billion years ago, billion years ago, we had the first um, organisms that came into being. These were um, bacteria, very primitive organisms, archaea and bacteria. They don't have a cell nucleus, but these were the first ones. And they were very important because these bacteria had, a, had the ability to use photosynthesis to produce oxygen. So before then, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. And from then on, the atmosphere could build up the oxygen that we have today because we wouldn't be alive otherwise. And neither would all the other animals or, and plants be alive because over the course of the Proterozoic, more and more animals and, and plants came into being. Green algae in particular, they helped bringing up the oxygen values. And then you see here the Phanerozoic. This is really where all the, life, the activity about life, the whole evolution and the, into diversity of life forms existed. And it's such a small time span. It's only about 500 million years, if you see in terms of the whole Earth's history. But when we look at the Phanerozoic in more detail, we can split it up in different eras. Again, they are um, split up because of different organisms that live there. So in here, in the Paleozoic, we had a tremendous proliferation of different life forms. The organisms became more and more complex. Plants came onto the land. Um, animals came onto the land about 400 million years ago. And then uh, the Mesozoic is really colloquially known as the era of the 
dinosaurs. And then the Cenozoic, the latest part, this is the era of the, the um, mammals. And that just means they were dominant. The mammals were actually older, but this is where the mammals have become dominant. Now, you still don't see any Jurassic in here. So I, I bet you want to know where is the Jurassic? And as I mentioned, it's a period. And it's a period in the Mesozoic. So it's like a subunit. And it again has three different periods. And the Jurassic period is this one, between 200 and 145 million years, roughly. And this has been, again, categorized using different fossils. So fossils play a huge um, importance in determining how old certain rocks are. And the Jurassic is a period where lots of rocks were deposited in the Jura Mountains, and that's the connection. But it's definitely, it's a time period. So we can have a Jurassic formation in New Jersey. We do, I think. Yes. Right? That's but that doesn't true. mean it looks like the Franche Comte. No, so the Jurassic is a, just a time period. So, of course, depending on where you're on Earth, you may have a desert environment. For example, in, in Utah and Nevada, you had a desert environment. You deposited dunes at the same moment that we had here, oceans that deposited um, limestones. So, depending on where you are, you have different types of rocks. But we do have Jurassic rocks um, in many places around the world, and especially in the western part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, now, um, we want to kind of go back a little bit to Courbet. Um, and um, we've seen that Courbet painted a lot of water, but he was also very much interested in rocks. And sometimes it's water and rocks, as we see in the, in the source paintings, and also in this uh, major painting that he also painted in 1864. Um, and um, yeah, the, the Gour de Conche, um, but sometimes it's just rocks. And I we show you three paintings. Um, I wanted to show, I, mean, I wanted to kind of give you an idea that although Courbet did landscapes, did his greatest landscapes, his best known landscapes all in 1864, he really was interested in landscape all his career. And so I wanted to show you an early drawing. This is from a sketchbook when he was actually still his students, uh, and it's a drawing of the Grebier. You remember that we looked earlier at the, that that ravine, so to speak, that uh, that Reto showed in the, in his diagram. Uh, so already at that time in the 1840s, he's kind of fascinated by the Franche Comté landscape. Even though at that time he doesn't really paint many landscape, but a number of drawings like this one that show these landscapes, and here just some photograph uh, from the internet. I mean, it's not the same angle, but you, you do get the sense how he really is uh, impressed by these huge vertical kind of rock formations. And then here's another one. Um, this is called La Chauvroche or the, the Bold Rock, uh, also from 1860, well, so maybe a little bit later, 1864, maybe a little later. Uh, and uh, I show it to you here in Corbet's Atelier in Besançon. I mentioned to you that part of the reason that he spent all this time in 1864 in Ornans is that he had his brand new studio. He really kind of wanted to take advantage of it. And so you see it standing there in the middle of the atelier, uh, the painting that, uh, that, uh, that you see over here. And then uh, another one, and uh, this is uh, a, um, it's called Landscape near Flagé. Flagé was actually a small town near Orleans where um, Courbet's grandfather had his farm. Courbet's father uh, was, was located in Orleans. The location of this painting is not really sure. Earlier on, it was called Orleans, now it's called Flagé. Uh, but again, I mean, from the point of view of the rock formations, this is what you really see when you go to the Franche Comte. These very steep rocks are partly kind of covered with green. And what I really wanted to ask you uh, is a little bit about how were these rocks formed? I mean, what, what made, made these really incredible, you know, rock formations in the Franche Comte? Yeah, so Gruber actually alluded to that by mentioning erosion, and that's a major part of the process of landscape formation here. And so 
to understand a little better about the Jura, these are, I mentioned before, rocks deposited in the ocean. And when rocks are deposited in the ocean, they are usually deposited flat, horizontally. And you see here these horizontal layers in, in the Lou Valley here. And it's very typical for the Jura. And you see also there are these deep gorges that are carved out by the water. When it comes out, actually in the Source de la Louis, it's coming out as a river and then keeps grinding down this gorge. Now, we can just briefly think these were deposited horizontally. So like this, and it is in geology a law, the oldest rocks are always at the bottom. That's how they are formed. And then the young, the higher up you go, the younger your rocks are. Now in the Jura, as I mentioned before, the Jura was folded very late in the Alpine chain formation. And it means that in fact, there was a, a pressure that came from the South because Africa was actually pushing against Europe. And so it pushed these layers together and they were deformed and formed these beautiful folds. And this is what you see in the Jura. Many of these chains, long mountain chains in the Jura are such folded layers that you can see and in fact, when the water starts eroding it after it has been weathering, you create these absolutely spectacular features, just like this, the Creux du Vent. You see here, the layers are gently folded and very typical for the Jura. On the top, you have these pastures at high altitude. That's where all the cows are making the excellent Comté cheese. And then we have here this clip, a very famous clip where the water is just basically grinding down the rock layers that have been deposited a long time ago. And you see here the individual, individual layers, the oldest at the bottom, the youngest in the top. Okay, I want to go to the next slide. Now, um, I want to just um, want to talk a little bit about Corbett's connection to geology and his knowledge about geology. And uh, for that reason, uh, we want to look at this painting, also painted in 1864, uh, called La Roche Pourrie, or the rotten rock, or the disintegrating rock. And it was called that way because constantly pieces fell off it. So people thought it just slowly was kind of falling apart, this rock. And um, uh, this is an interesting painting because it was commissioned from Courbet by a man by the name of Jules Marcoux. And Jules Marcoux was a very well-known French geologist uh, who was born in Salin, which is near, uh, near actually the Source de Lison, um, and uh, who early in life started as a kind of an amateur geologist. He was a very sickly kid. And so he was kind of, going around in the region. He didn't go to school very much and finding fossils and getting interested in all that. And uh, somehow uh, he got, he met people in the region who then introduced him to other people. And finally he was introduced to Agassiz. And Agassiz, of course, a very well-known uh, Swiss geologist who later became a professor at Harvard. And because of that, uh, Marcoux in 1847 actually traveled to America and went to um, Boston and, um, and then kind of started collaborating with Agassiz. He also found an American wife, Jane Belknap. Um, and so the rest of his life, he kind of shuttled a little bit back and forth between Europe and America, but really spent a lot of time in America, traveling all over America, finding Jurassic um, landscapes in, uh, in the United States. Now in 1864, as it happens, um, Marcoux had decided to come back to Salin, his birthplace for a year because he wanted his sons, he had two little boys and he wanted them to speak French fluently. So he thought he packed up his whole family and they went for the year uh, to back to, um, um, to Salin. As it happens, uh, when Courbet painted the, uh, the Source de Lison, he was actually on his way to Salin. He did that on his way from Arnon to Salin because he wanted to visit his high school friend, Max Bouchon. And Max Bouchon knew Marcoux and uh, introduced Courbet to Marcoux or the other way around. And the two of them kind of hit it off. 
uh, Mahku gave him some Native American weapons that he could hang on the wall of his new studio. And uh, he also asked Courbet to paint his painting of this rock, which was the subject of his first publication. His first major publication had been on this, uh, on this rock. And if we, can I have the next one for a moment? Next, here's a detail. And there you actually see Jules Marcoux, this little guy in the circle, in the oval, in the egg. And uh, he is, to me, it looks like he's studying fossil. You know, he's kind of bent over the stone, looking at the fossil, maybe he's taking notes. It's not, not totally clear. And then, of course, here you see a photograph of, of Jules, Marcoux, um, Jules Marcoux as well. Now, um, I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit about what fossils he was finding here. So that's a fascinating thing because the Jurassic period is defined by fossils. So clearly, when we start looking at these rocks, we look at many different fossils. And that was a, a study topic that um, kept people very busy because there's so many different species different animals, different plants. And so what I'm showing you here, this is a microscopic image of a rock that I collected in the cliffs just above the Source du Lison. And microscopic, you see here, this is one millimeter for scale. And what you see here is all biological material. Fract fractured pieces from different animals. For example, here, you see, this is a little piece of a snail, of a gastropod. And then you have here these long elongate pieces here these are from bivalves or like mussels or and and then you have these rounded pieces here these are regarded as fecal pellets lots of do these are round and when you study these you can actually determine the species of the animals that are there and it allows you to reconstruct the paleo environment and we can zoom in a little bit here is another gastropod so a shell and you see very nicely, this is the actual shell inside. You have the, the inside that is empty, actually where the animal was living. And this is the house, if you like. And then here you have a nice piece of a shell. It looks like an oyster almost. So by determining the species, we can determine not just the ecosystem, who lives with whom in these um, areas, but we can tell even water depth. We can talk about, we can determine water temperature, infer water temperature. So that tells us in this period, the rocks were deposited, this was about 170 million years ago, in a very, very shallow ocean, close to the coast, where these animals, they lived all within the sediment, and they died there and were fossilized. And this gives us tremendously important information about the Earth's history, because it allows us to reconstruct how these ecosystems behaved and how they came into being. And when we reconstruct that globally, we get this picture here. And it's an, a little unusual view of our planet, 170 million years ago, so exactly the time when the rocks at Source du Lison were deposited, as we know from the fossils. And what you see here is, we will be right there, and this light blue color indicates a sh very shallow ocean that existed at that time. You see here, perhaps you recognize Iberia, and this is part of Central Europe, there's England there. And down here, you see a lot of these continents are still together, because about 260 million years ago, all the continents formed one big landmass, which is called Pangaea. And of course, the rest of the globe was ocean, as you see. And this landmass, Pangaea, lasted until about this time in the Jurassic when it started to break apart. And one of the features is that an ocean arm started to break into the Gondwana, uh, between Gondwana, the lower, the southern planet as southern continent and the northern continent. So even a deep sea started to exist there. So we can actually derive a lot of detailed information from studying fossils that are really, really old. And that's quite amazing that we can determine the water temperature and the depth at which these animals lived 170 million years ago. Well, fascinating. So where we now you have just incredibly tall rocks. I mean, at one point, <laughs> there was actually a sea. It's kind of amazing. So that kind of leads me a little bit to the next question. I mean, once you, you had kind of a little bit already told me this, um, not far from Salin, 
which is actually named after it, uh, is a small village called arc en -Senon. And in arc en uh, what was, was in the 18th century and continuing in the 19th century, a very large salt mine. And Salin, of course, itself uh, has the word sal, uh, French word sal for salt. So, um, and this salt mine is still very famous today because the, uh, the works, so th these are mostly the administrative buildings uh, for the salt mine, uh, were built by a very well known French 18th century architect by the name of Le Dieu. And this is actually on the UNESCO, it's a UNESCO World Heritage site because it is, of course, you, as you can see in this picture, a, a very beautiful. Um, you know, 18th century architectural ensemble. Uh, today, it's a, actually a conference center, but when, you're, when you come as a visitor, you can still visit the old salt mines. Can you, the next slide, maybe? Uh, and the, the kind of tunnels going through there that are no longer used. And um, I was asking um, Reto earlier, um, First of all, why are they not used anymore? And second of all, was there, is there salt all everywhere in the Franche Comté, or is it only in this location? Yeah, so salt, of course, was a very, very precious material. It also was called the white gold. And all of France was actually using this salt, and it was um, heavily taxed. It was basically the kings became very rich because of this salt. But this institution here was a model institution, both from the engineering standpoint and from the societal standpoint, too. So they were very generous with their employees. But they also had a very interesting mechanism to bring the salt up. So the salt is deep down. It's about 250 meters on the ground. So underneath the Jurassic layers, there are all the rocks, and they were deposited in salt lakes. At that time, it was a very arid, hot climate there. Where in your cellar. And so whatever water existed accumulated in these basins and evaporated. So the water disappeared and it makes big salt crusts. And then they were covered. And so that, that's why we have these big salt layers on the large portions of the Jura Mountains. But here it was found by accident about 1,200 years ago that there were salty springs. So groundwater actually tapped into the salt deposits on the ground, dissolved it and brought it up to the surface. And then people started to use that salt. And in more modern history, when they designed and built these plants, they brought commercially, they brought these waters up and they evaporated them. So they boiled off the water in big, big pans at the surface. And to do that, they actually heated up the water and they used at the beginning wood. So much so that they ran out of wood in the vicinity, and then they switched over in the 19th century to coal. And then they moved over to Senos uh, to, for the Royal Salt Works, and they had to transport the water for more than 20 kilometers in pipes and underground tunnels like this. So it's quite a spectacular design, and that's why it's on, on the UNESCO World Heritage site. It's too bad that it's not in operation anymore, but it was a, a leading institution and for a really important material. And you know, the salary is basically derived from salt. You were paid in salt in those times because it was so precious. And that's why it was called the white, called the white gold. Now, this kind of brings us to um, um, back in a way to um, uh, our painting here. Uh, because you talked a little bit about the exploitation of the region, which of course was an important thing. I mean, the French Comté had a lot of industry. It had tons of mills because they had all these cascades and, and, and waterfalls and stuff like that, rivers. So there were mills everywhere. They, you already mentioned the cheese. They had a lot of cows. They had a little wine industry, which didn't really, poor best father was particularly wanted to, to you know, promote the wine industry in the Franche Côté, which didn't really work that well. Uh, they had iron. Uh, there was a big iron industry, made iron wires. So they had a lot of industry. And uh, that industry, of course, at times uh, came a little in conflict uh, with the beauty of the region. And um, if we maybe we can go for a moment to the next slide. 
Uh, you see here a mid 19th century print of the Source de Luzon. And you see all these kind of factory buildings. So, uh, you know, they were all mills and, and, uh, and, and later in the early 20th century was actually an electrical power station. There's a postcard of the early 20th century showing that power station. So Kurba had to kind of set up his easel in a very particular way uh, to kind of get that beautiful natural site. Uh, by the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, there was a real movement, um, you know, we would say, perhaps call it today an environmental movement, but it was also kind of linked, of course, to the whole idea of the development of tourism um, uh, to get rid of this, or at least as is done now, to kind of make it somewhat invisible so that, you, that tourists could still go uh, to, uh, to see these sites. Um, so my question really is, I mean, today I, I think the, the, the mills and the factories and all that is no longer really an issue uh, from an environmental standpoint, but is this region uh, also perhaps still at risk for other environmental weather factors, climate change factors, water shortage or too much water uh, or what have you? Yeah, so the... As we all know, the climate is changing rapidly and it's due to the fact that we emit a lot of CO2, anthropogenic um, CO2 emissions. And this has the, the bad side effect that the water, the rainwater becomes more acidic. And that means the more acidic it is, the more we dissolve these rocks. So, and perhaps you have heard of ocean acidification. The ocean picks up a lot of CO2 and that turns into carbonic acids or real acid that attacks the shells of these animals, coral reefs. And the same thing happens to these rocks that are made up of these shells. So the more acidic the rainwater becomes, the more weathering we have, the more dissolution we have. So it will affect the landscape, no question. We don't know exactly how long it will take, but it will take a long time until it's gone completely, but we will definitely speed up the weathering and the erosion process. And then in terms of rain, it's hard to predict if we will have more rain here or less rain, that is really regionally different. The temperature increases are also very different. In the Alps, it's way above two degrees already, so much more than the global average. So it's regionally very different, and each case has to be studied separately and in detail to make pro projections in the future. Well, um, I think that core best paintings perhaps will contribute a little bit to making people aware that this you know, should these landscapes should be preserved and uh, that, that sh and cherished uh, because we don't want it to turn back into an ocean uh, <laughs> anytime soon. So uh, that's kind of uh, the more or less not really the end of our conversation, but we kind of would like to end you all into uh, what we've been talking about. If you have questions or comments or complaints, um, uh, we are. Hi, um, hello. Oh, you have to turn this on. Oh, you did. Oh. Testing. Okay, so my question is, um, what is the most common uh, method um, you use to like trace the the age of the fossils is a carbon dating. Oh, thank you for this question. The question is how are these ages determined? Um, no, you can't do carbon dating for such old rocks. Carbon dating is only possible to about five thousand six thousand years, not more. So this is all or mostly based on what is called biostratigraphy, where worldwide the different fossils are studied and we find the evolution of the different shells and you know different animals or plants and we can make a succession of how they evolve so it, it's it's a dating using fossils and whenever possible we want to use physical dates that we can actually create for example if there's a volcanic eruption and puts down a layer in these sediments 
then we can get a hard date on it by measuring the absolute date. Everything else is kind of hooked onto these um, definitive time points. And in between, it's all biostatistics. So using the evolution as because you can see how these species evolve, how the shells change in shape or size, and that's very well documented. Can you please just repeat the pronunciation of the word that comes after bio for the dating? So it's called biostratigraphy. So it's it's basically the science of the strata or the layers. Oh. So you know, I showed you before the oldest layer is at the bottom and the youngest is on the top. And then you, for example, at the soup to these own, you can go from the bottom to the top and see how the the fossils change. And that's a relative data, right? And then you try to hook it up to another section where we have also the, the next stage, for example, or the earlier stage. And then we try to correlate these different layers of the rocks using the fossils. Yeah, it's, it's somewhat similar to tree ring dating, where we have also a record down oh, back to about 5,000 years using, you know, not an individual tree, but we correlate trees in different areas. And we get a really uh, a segment of the history that, that we know very well because we know each tree in a temperate environment creates two rings per year. So we can count. And then we correlate with the next tree. So it's, it's a similar mechanism that we use. I found it very important to understand, which I didn't think about, that it's very based on relativity, right? So Cretaceous is always above. Jurassic or something like that, so that you that you kind of that you always have to think in terms of these layers that the top layer is always younger than the bottom layer, and yes. then of course it gets difficult when they all start shifting. But, yes, uh, you're in trouble if a layer is turned upside down, which happens. <laughs> Imagine if you fold a rock that is originally flat and you fold it like this and you turn it around, then suddenly the youngest layer is at the bottom, and that's where we have to make a really uh, detailed study to figure this out at the beginning. But once you're in the field, you can see these things. Yes? Um, how important is the contribution of those who do who look at fossils uh, to the scientific and the scientific and the scientific and the scientific and the Yeah. So this was a really productive time in the Geology, the history of geology, where people started to understand, you know, that we see fossils and these are extinct animals um, or plants for that matter, too. And people became really interested in that. And at that time, they still were observing very carefully, making detailed drawings. So many times we have detailed drawings of these times. And then later, you know, scientists have new technologies with, with photographs and they measure the fossils, and, and that evolves into this comprehensive picture we have today. But the early geologists were instrumental and they came up with theories, some were wrong, some were right, and some were the foundation of today's understanding of the earth. So it's a very important time in, in the history of geology. And the amount of fossils they found were in the tens of thousands, right? I mean, there were huge, huge amount of fossils. Um, that uh, and that all had different names. We were talking earlier, you know, when Marcou writes his little booklet on the Roche Puri, there's actually one fossil that he calls, what is it, the Hippocleopus Marcou. And I thought that Marcou had named it after himself, but now we have learned who was it who created that name? It was so yeah, so some other scholar first discovered it, but in honor of Marcou, he named it. Yeah, because you can't name a fossil after yourself. <laughs> <laughs> or a mineral after yourself, the same thing. But basically, you know, you've seen in some of these snail shells, and the snails, they are on our planet since about five and a million years. That's when they first appeared. And they're still here. Some, so some species evolved and others went extinct, like the dinosaurs, for example, as a classic example. But you know, those that are still around, we can we have a almost um complete sequence of development and different species evolved. So it's a very well-studied topic and we can learn so much about the history of the Earth. At the beginning, this was the main way to study the, the Earth's history. 
because in the 19th century, 18th century, we didn't have the kind of instrumentation that we have today that we can actually analyze an exact date for a rock. That was not possible. Uh, I'm really struck by the uh, just the power of the, the natural elements. I mean, there's always some little incredibly rickety man made things stuck in there, a handrail, a bridge in the distance that looks like it's so flimsy by comparison. Is that a, a Corvette shape? Is that, uh, is that all along with other kinds of approaches pertaining to this landscape? Or is he actually making some, some statement about? This yeah. Well, it's a very good point. I mean, of it's course. All yeah, yeah. Looks like it's about to collapse. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes there are little figures on it. For example, the good course one that we have to go all the way back. But I mean, you have actually tourists kind of walking there. But it's it's a very good, interesting point. I mean, we were talking earlier about the way Corbett painted these paintings, and that's why I read you a little bit more about that painting. So he did not, he painted his entire painting outdoors, which was actually novel at that time. I mean, we think of the Impressionists doing that, but we don't really think of earlier artists doing that. Uh, but Corbett did not finish the painting. So he, he laid in the painting, entirely with the palette knife. He, he did not use brushes in front of the motif or very little. Then he took it home and then with the brush, he would finish the painting. So you, you, I showed you the picture of the atelier with that one painting. And then if you looked really carefully, you would see that it's kind of a little bit rough. And I think at that point, you know, I, was, I have really not given it so much thought, but I'm now kind of really interested in your question. I think he may just have put in these little details with the brush because, you know, he was kind of playing with it and it seemed like a good idea. Uh, maybe sometimes like in the good, of course, there was a, a little red figure dressed in red, so you get a little color, a little little thing to fasten your eye on, so to speak. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting point. I have to kind of give that a lot of... Well, that's what you just... Yeah, so so kind of to get to kind of make people kind of just want to say fasten your eye on make people kind of be able to relate to it. See over here, this is artificial. This is not natural. It's a little canal that was built, and you can still see it. And he's actually depicted it. This is where it went to the mills. Yeah. 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 It's good. <laughs> It's amazing how realistic these paintings are. It's for very nice. I mean, I, you know, I, I heard the, uh, you know, the thing on the stage, you know, the model of the world, whatever. But is, is he known for his landscape? Is that the, you know, I don't know too much about it. Well, um, he started out uh, his career, his public career, mostly as a figure painter. So he's very famous uh, in, in, in the late 40s and early 50s. He produces a number of huge paintings that he exhibits in Paris that make him notorious in a way. So one is called the Stone Breakers. Maybe I've seen that painting where you see the two guys breaking the stones to make the road. And then there's a, a huge canvas that is called a burial at Ornance. So it's a very large painting where you see a burial we do not know of whom, but maybe maybe inspired by his grandfather's burial. And that made him notorious because nobody at that time thought that a simple burial in a simple village in some backward region was worth painting on that scale. So everybody was kind of laughing about him. And then he did, uh, you know, did a number of, uh, you know, a few more of these big paintings. But then after that, he painted everything. He painted nudes, he painted portraits. Uh, and, and then particularly in the 1860s, he really started to concentrate on landscapes. And I think the landscapes ultimately proved to be most um, saleable. Uh, and so uh, there, there are a lot of them. And 
there are even more than there should be because when you know Kurbev was a kind of a rebel, and so in 1870, uh, you know, during the Commune in France, he was one of the people who overthrew the Vendome Column, which was a symbol, of course, of imperial power. And so he was. Uh, they told him he had to pay back the the money to re-erect the Commune. He didn't want to do that, so he went in exile in Switzerland. And he hoped to earn enough money so that he could actually get that sum together so he could go back to France. So he started a kind of a, a factory of Courbet paintings where he had a, a number of um, students and assistants working and they turned out almost exclusively landscapes. So if you look at this landscape, this is actually a, it's called School of Courbet, but I forget what the label says. But that's probably not by Courbet. And there are probably hundreds of paintings like this that uh, are, in a way, his style was easy to copy because of the, he used a palette knife. So, you know, if you just took a palette knife and you slapped some green paint on the canvas, then you, you, and you put a red signature, he always signed in red, also part of his rebellious spirit, then you could try to sell this as a, as a Courbet. So he's known for his landscapes because there's so many of them, but he did a little bit of everything. Thank you so much. I, I, I realize it's involved in the wall and I'm making this landscape and pictures, but I'm, but I'm also more, uh, wondering a bit about the vegetation and uh, what kind of vegetation you see in the pictures, what kind of vegetation belongs to the landscape, how that changed. So maybe just looking around, I, I, I'm always having a hard time to be recognizing what kind of actually grows there. And so I, I'm just wondering whether you could just talk about it. Well, so the, down in the river valleys, it's mostly deciduous trees. And so in winter, it's kind of barren. But on the high plains of the Jura, so above those folds and the, you know, where the patches are, this is where the big forests are as well. And uh, Peter, you re refer to this, the name Jura, which means forest, that's the forest. So the forests, these are pine forests on the, on the high elevation. Uh, very characteristic. That's kind of the typical vegetation for that area. Whereas in the valleys, it's much more, you know, trees and leaves. But the vegetation plays a, a major role in the, in the weathering process because plants also exude acid, acid that attack limestone. So the more plants you have, the more disintegration of the rocks you will have. Well, the Jura uh, given by the uh, Romans, was the Romans give that designation to the mountains, the Jura mountains, or how does that name here? I mean, well, as far as I know, it is a, a Gaelic name yeah. originally, but there are different versions of the story. But that's, I think, the most commonly. That's what I heard too. Yeah. That it was like. A... Yeah, that's the interpretation. So it's a local name that has always been there. Yeah. And, and you had a question too? Yeah, excuse me, I really appreciated your multidisciplinary approach to this. I, I don't know if this is a common circumstance of either of you like work with, you know, scientists. You like it too. Yeah, it's sort of really like a wonderful evaluation of the work. So I appreciated your perspectives coming to this. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating uh, conversation. Well, thank you very much. Well, on that note, thank you. <laughs>